Hello, uh, I'm Ksenia Svetlova, and uh, we are about to start our webinar in just a couple of minutes. So please stay with us as uh, we have more people joining. Uh, and all of our wonderful participants are already here in anticipation. All right, I think that we are good to go. More people are joining us, uh, but uh, it's a good time uh, to start uh, our very special webinar, Women in Peace Building and Diplomacy in the Middle East. Uh, this is a special series of ROPES uh, webinars, and I'm Ksenia Svetlova, the incoming uh, CEO of ROPES. Uh, ROPES uh, was founded in 2017 to connect forward-thinking Israeli Arab Palestinian emerging leaders across the Middle East in politics, business, and other fields with like minded peers uh, all across the region. Our growing alumni network includes members of parliament, diplomats, journalists, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and other young change makers from Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and 10 Arab countries. We are united by our vision of post conflict Middle East, in which the state of Israel, as well as the state of Palestine are fully integrated into the peaceful uh, Middle East. Uh, we are basically working on connecting uh, people uh, and uh, for our special webinar uh, uh, in March, uh, we decided to dedicate it uh, to women, uh, 50 or even more percent of the population uh, and uh, their role uh, in peacemaking, diplomacy, international relations uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we in ROPES believe uh, in full equality, uh, not only between genders, between people, between ethnicities, uh, and uh, there is, there will be no peace uh, uh, unless women will be fully integrated in it and will play, it will play an important role uh, in every process here across the region, whether we are talking about uh, negotiations, whether it's uh, hopefully peace agreements uh, that can be signed, uh, and again, uh, uh, as you know, Middle East uh, was never uh, uh, easy and uh, a quiet place, uh, and a lot is going on also right now. Uh, before I will introduce our two uh, wonderful uh, participants, uh, and each of them has a uni unique story uh, about uh, how women influence the Middle East uh, and how do they perceive uh, the various situations sometimes of conflict uh, or of peacemaking. Um, I would like to tell you that, unfortunately, uh, we uh, are hosting today two participants rather than three. Our third participant, a Palestinian from West Bank, was unable to join us due to pressures uh, that came uh, basically following the announcement of this webinar. Uh, we are very sorry for that. Uh, and in ROPES, we, are truly, we truly believe uh, in uh, uh, communication, uh, in uh, uh, cooperation for the sake of the future. Because when people cannot talk, guns will. And it's our strong belief that while we absolutely uh, try to protect uh, every, everybody, uh, of uh, our alumni, our participants, our speakers, and so on, uh, we're very much hopeful that in the future, we will have uh, an opportunity to host, again, wonderful women from West Bank, from Gaza, from East Jerusalem, because their voice is important. Uh, their voice should be heard. Uh, and it was absolutely our, our goal uh, also for tonight. Uh, and uh, again, you know, we are wishing uh, our participant uh, first of, and most of all safety, uh, personal safety and uh, again, safety for her family. 
uh, and uh, friends and so on. Uh, and we are joining our hands today in the prayer, and we are today in the holy month of Ramadan, uh, that there will be peace upon our lands in Israel, in Palestine, in every part of the Middle East. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our two uh, panelists for today, uh, with whom we will discuss uh, the role and the challenges uh, for women uh, here in the Middle East uh, in peacemaking and diplomacy. I would first start uh, with uh, Anat Saragusti, a dear friend, an Israeli journalist, a publicist, and a jurist. Anat's professional career includes former CEO of Agenda, Israeli Center for Strategic Communications, former news editor, reporter, and photographer. And for, for, for those who are unaware of Anat's work, I don't believe that there are many, uh, but still, you should definitely seek her work. Uh, it's uh, all over the Google. Uh, unique reports from Beirut, Anat, right, uh, where you uh, reported uh, from the war in Lebanon uh, and uh, interview with uh, Yasser Arafat uh, and other Middle Eastern leaders. Anat is also known as a peace activist and a human rights advocate. She's among the founders of uh, Ta a group of leading Israeli women with media and orientation, and Merkaz Media Nashim, the Gender Media Center. Um, um, another participant that will be joining us today uh, is another friend, uh, Karina Ranem. Uh, Karina, Karima uh, is uh, a Moroccan journalist and activist in the fields of gender, diversity, and youth. She works as a senior managing editor at the New Africa magazine, uh, as a freelance journalist with Morocco World News, and independent consultant for Niras Sweden on media self-regulation international training program. Ms. Ranem is also the president of the International Center of Diplomacy and CEO of Africa, my home. She has previously worked at, at the Moroccan Times uh, as a counterpart international and US embassy in Rabat. Ranem has won more than 36 international awards and is ranking as one of the top 35 and 100 most influential young leaders and top as 100 women CEO in Africa. Well, uh, Karima, uh, you know, you're a star. <laughs> what can I say? You know, it's uh, it's a pleasure to uh, get to know you, and I'm very proud to say that Karima uh, is always an alumni uh, of Ropes, uh, and uh, she visited Israel last year uh, with a special delegation that we hosted from across the Arab world. Um, so um, I will first uh, ask uh, the two of you to share your experience and to talk a little bit about the role of women. Uh, in uh, peace building, peacemaking, uh, diplomacy uh, in our region. Uh, must it be a goal? Uh, do you think that uh, if women will not be involved, is peace achievable uh, at all? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, your unique voices are very important uh, for us to hear. Um, I uh, uh, invite everyone of our uh, uh, viewers and uh, listeners uh, to send questions uh, through the Q&A. Uh, and we will definitely address all of the questions that will be sent to us, um, but that's later. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with you, Anat. Well, when I first uh, learned about you, I think, uh, me myself, I was a very young journalist, um, and uh, I think I was looking for something in the archives. It was still the newspaper archives that you had to go to Hebrew University and to really look for real newspapers and so on. And I came across your reports. Uh, from the battlefield, uh, but you do not consider yourself a war journalist, do you? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I consider myself a journalist uh, that used uh, photography. Actually, I'm a, an activist and a journalist, and I use photography as one of the tools, and then the pen, you know, before the uh, keyboard as the another tool. But um, I think that I had the uh, opportunity um, to develop a special um, eye or a special look at the region because I was a journalist and because I had the uh, opportunity to go and report from the West Bank, from Gaza and from Lebanon during the first Lebanon war. So I could see, I could really see the, the things on the ground. I could really see, you know, the, the refugee camps 
in the Gaza Strip and in Southern Lebanon and in Beirut. And I could see the refugee camps in the West Bank. And I could see, you know, I could see that I could see and I could speak to, to Palestinians and to Lebanese and to Jordanians and then to Bedouins in the, in the Sinai uh, Desert and, uh, and in Egypt. So I could really touch upon um, the, the lives, the daily lives of, of the people. And I think that it was then that I developed a special angle to look at those, those people, because usually what you see when you, when you watch the news um, and you sit, for example, in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem, if you're in Israel and you watch the news, all you see about the Palestinians or the Jordanians or the Lebanese is like a mass of, of, of nobodies. And it's very alienating. And you don't see the human side of them. And they, they are considered or they are defined as the enemy and the terrorists and, and the people who want to just to kill you and throw you to, to the sea, etc. And I really feel lucky that I had the opportunity to see the the opposite side of it, the human side of it. And I felt that it is my, my duty to deliver those, those names and those people and those stories uh, to the Israeli audience. So I think then I, I started to develop um, my kind of uh, uh, feminist uh, journalism. And um, and later on, I, I became you know very active in in the women organization in Israel and and mainly um, around the women and security issues um, in the beginning of the 2000s when right after the um, uh, UN uh, council, the um, council resolution uh, 20, uh, 1325 uh, the UN Security Council resolution. Um, 1325 that, that for the first time recognized the, the fact that women and, and, and young girls in, in conflict areas uh, see or suffer or experience the conflict differently. And therefore, uh, there, there are the three Ps, right? Protection, participation, prevention that should be implemented. And so women should be part of, of solving the problem and not only part of, of uh, being the, the victims of, of uh, the violence. And, and I was really, really very active in that. And actually Israel was the first uh, country in the world to turn this uh, um, UN resolution into a state law. And this was in 2005. And it was really a very rare moment in which, you know, uh, members of Knesset, two uh, women, female members of Knesset, Knesset is our parliament, um, together this, um, managed to, to pass this bill that uh, forced the ENIC forum that the government uh, established to include um, women from the um, diverse communities in Israel. And this was really a breakthrough. Uh, at least we saw it then as a breakthrough. And we were full of hope that this, this will make a real change, that we have the right tool to make the change and to be part of the negotiations and to be part of any forum that deals with, I don't know, from starting a war or military operation towards um, solving it, um, negotiations, um, any kind of uh, policy making, et cetera. And actually since we started to work on it and, and we started to um, draft a kind of a national action plan to, to implement this uh, resolu UN resolution and to, to, to try to monitor how the state is implementing it and how the state is really um, making it come true that women are part of the, uh, or re are represented or are pa participating in the um, peacemaking forums or in the negotiation forum. I, I don't think there was any peace then or now. And slowly, slowly, you know, it was, it's already almost 20 years since this uh, law have been uh, passed in the Knesset nothing really happened. So the, the, the status of women in Israel, I think is deteriorating. 
especially now. And you can see it, how it reflects in, in the participation in the, in the Knesset, in the parliament, that there are less women now than there have been before. And less women sit in the, in the government and less women sit in the cabinet. You can hardly see women in decision-making processes. And this is really worrying. So if I reflect in a retrospect on the last, I don't know, 20 years, I think we are, we are again down the hill. We were up the hill at the beginning, at the, the beginning of the 2000s, when we still had the hope and we had this uh, UN resolution in our hand as a flag that we can, we can raise. And now it's, it's, it's much different. First of all, nobody speaks about any kind of negotiation, any peace process. This has been halted, I don't know, a few years ago. I think the last one who tried to, to um, push into peace negotiation was John Kerry during the uh, Obama administration. And this was years ago. So um, maybe Trump with the Abraham Accords, but with the Palestinians, there is nothing going on. And the fact that the, our Palestinian participant can, cannot be here today is, you know, reflects the, the, the bad situation uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, and women, of course, are, uh, they do suffer more. So women are anyway um, like a second class citizens in Israel and in Palestine because we are not part of, of, uh, of a decision making forum. So we have to start, you know, um, pushing our way from the beginning again and, and you know, try to break the, the glass ceiling. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anat. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with 1325, uh, the uh, UN resolution uh, on the necessity of involving of women uh, in uh, peacemaking and diplomacy, um, uh, it's a very important document. Uh, and indeed, uh, it was adopted by uh, many countries. Uh, the problem is that uh, nobody is really acting uh, on this uh, to implement it, you know, to adapt it's one thing, to implement is different. Uh, this is why we believe in ropes that first of all, you know, uh, all of our delegations, all of our uh, summits are always uh, based on gender equality. Uh, we always uh, involve women uh, because I think that uh, at least the new generation uh, of uh, young leaders uh, should uh, grow up uh, with this understanding uh, that it's absolutely not okay to have any negotiation team uh, or any uh, staff uh, at your office uh, that does not involve uh, women uh, and uh, not just one woman, uh, but a full women representation. And not just a short follow-up question before we'll go to Karima. Uh, so uh, being uh, a journalist who worked in the conflict zones myself, uh, I always heard the same question. Uh, why do you do it? You're a girl, you're a woman, uh, you're a mother. Why do you want to go to Tahrir Square? Uh, I uh, always uh, was very offended by this question. And I always told, uh, you know, so uh, you're asking me, how do I go to Tahrir as a mother? But uh, I know that uh, all of the uh, guys who are going to Tahrir to report it, they are fathers. You don't ask them, how do they leave their kids? You know, they are fathers. Aren't fathers important? Uh, did you uh, came across uh, this uh, uh, inquiries yourself? Unmute, unmute. Well, sure, it's the same thing. It's always the same. And, uh, you know, we had to, as women, we had to, uh, I don't know, make, even fight in the newsroom, <laughs> be recognized as equal. You know, I remember my first argument with my editor back in the, in the eighties when I wanted to go, when I wanted to go to Lebanon when the, there was a war there, and he said, "Well, I maybe I'll send the um, the male photographer." And I said, "What? <laughs> <laughs> you don't dare to do that." And later, when I became a mother and I had to, you know, I used to send my kid to to the kindergarten and then drove all the way to Gaza, which is an hour drive from Tel Aviv, as you as you know. Yeah. 
And people would say, are you crazy? I mean, how do you do that? But I mean, this is the job. Uh, first of all, I felt that I'm doing something very meaningful. You too, you did the same thing. I'm doing something very, very meaningful. And I think it was important even to, for my son to know that I'm doing something meaningful and, and important and, and, you know, for the whole public. So um, it, it only motivated me more. Yes, indeed, it only motivates more. Uh, Karima, I want to go to you now, uh, also to talk about your personal experience, uh, because uh, I, you know, going through your resume, uh, it seems that it was a career choice uh, that you made very at a very young age. I have to say that you are very young today, uh, while achieving all of these uh, uh, wonderful uh, things that you achieved. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, you know, Ma Anat mentioned that right now in Israeli parliament, we actually have less women than we used to have. And there is absolutely, you know, it's a shortage of women uh, in the government. Uh, there is no doubt about this. While at the same time, we see a positive change in many of the Arab states uh, and uh, many of the states specifically of Abraham Accords. Uh, we see it in the UAE, we see it also in Saudi Arabia, still not the Abraham Accords. We also see it in Morocco. Can you please uh, walk us through you know, why is this change happening today? Uh, we are very happy with it, and we will, will we see more uh, in the future? Uh, thank you very much. First of all, it's uh, very, uh, I'm very happy to be with you today, and especially that I'm very happy to be uh, one of the alumni of Rope. And uh, I think uh, uh, Rope uh, uh, is a, a, a um, an organization that enables uh, different stakeholders from Israel, Palestine, and, and different Arab countries, more specifically uh, from uh, countries who signed the Abraham uh, Accords to, to have a platform uh, for dialogue and exchanging views, perceptions. And sometimes we might not agree about certain approaches and aspects, but at least we have a dialogue. And at the same time, uh, it is very important for us uh, to, um, to meet people in, uh, in person. And when we visit uh, different stakeholders from both parties, we have a different perspective from what we're actually seeing from the media. And I think uh, I was very privileged to, uh, to be twice uh, to the region. And so a uh, few things uh, that actually enable me to correct uh, different perceptions that I have. Um, and your question actually is very important because I've been working uh, uh, on gender issues for the past 20 years. And of course, yes, uh, there is a, uh, a, a strong dynamic, more specifically from uh, civil society organizations, uh, women-led organizations, human rights organizations that are advocating to uh, um, uh, advocating for change, uh, more specifically changing the situation of women, whether in politics, in economy, and all different sectors. Now, of course, if I want to talk more specifically about the case of Morocco, uh, of course, in the past 20 years, we have seen a lot of changes uh, uh, in terms of women women's rights. And more specifically, if we just take from the period of the 2011 constitution after the Arab Spring, uh, we, uh, we have uh, managed to constitu constitutionalize the, uh, the, uh, the principles of equality in the constitution. And therefore, um, uh, it was translated into many legislations that um, forwarded or advanced the situation of women more specifically uh, at the level of economy and politics. And also we have been able to uh, also um, uh, create what we call gen gender budget sensitive, gender sensitive budgeting, uh, which uh, uh, allowed uh, different uh, public sectors to reserve specific budget uh, for women programming, which is very important. And that is implemented at the government level and also at the uh, local government level. Um, if uh, I think mo uh, uh, moving forward with, um, with women's rights is very important in peace building 
which is the subject of uh, um, our um, uh, conference uh, today, because uh, it is linked. Uh, and uh, today, uh, in in many um, uh, organizations, they started linking. Uh, security and uh, political issues uh, related more specifically to stability uh, and also to development. And Morocco, uh, Morocco's case is, uh, I will say, is unique because Morocco, uh, um, since the um, uh, the Casablanca bombing in 2003, they they uh, they worked on a, what we call the the uh, the peace, security, development nexus. So, and, and that is very important because uh, the, the country has a global perspective of peace and women are one of the core prince, uh, one, one of the core uh, actors of, of peace building. And, you know, um, when, when we worked on, on, on this nexus, uh, a lot of people were talking uh, to us and asking, you know, why, were, why are you working on uh, peace? Why are you advancing women in peace, more specifically in terms of the uh, 1325 resolution? You are not a conflict zone country. Um, and uh, actually when we started as civil society organizations working on the, uh, on the, the implementation of 1325 and also 20, uh, the resolution of 2250, uh, which is youth peace and uh, security, uh, you know, it was not that much trendy, that much interesting for people because they said, okay, we're not a conflict zone. But, you know, uh, uh, especially after COVID-19, you know, people started understanding that conflict is not just a war. You know, we were, are facing, you know, a plur pluridisciplinary uh, issues uh, that may affect stability in the country. And therefore, uh, since we are a globalized uh, world and uh, sometimes uh, transborder issues affect us uh, we uh, we need to act and we need to comply with different um, uh, conventions that uh, uh, we we have signed uh, and uh, uh, morocco uh, in 2000 i think 21 uh, uh, developed its first action plan on P women, peace, and, and security. And that's one of the most important things that uh, we have today because I um, want to give you some interesting uh, statistics about peace building. Um, let's say uh, globally, uh, you will see that there is a, a real gap in terms of women leadership in peace building and the women who are victims of peace and war. Uh, and, you know, according to the 2022 statistics, we have only 13% of women who are at the table of negotiation. We have only 6% of mediators and 6% who signed uh, a global peace accords. And the gap is so big because we have 75% of people who are victims of violence and wars. And you know that that uh, that uh, makes us think: How can we uh, uh, empower women to uh, in the peace building process? And more specifically, that in 2022 we have celebrated 22 years of the implementation of 1325. So, what have we done uh, about it? Uh, in terms of conflicts, in terms of conflicts, we have a you know. Uh, we have very different dimensions of conflict. Now we're talking about uh, issues of climate change that impact migration issues, refugee issues, impact stability, impact security. So it's, it's interrelated, interconnected. So if you lose one of the factors, then you know it, it's a whole cycle. So it impacts all the other factors. So therefore you need to have a really a global integrated strategy that involves governments, civil society, private sector and different stakeholders. And the most important thing I, I think in my opinion when, when we view the conflicts today, when, you know what happens in Palestine and Israel and uh, maybe China, it's not something that happens to others. It could affect me. And, and that is what we have seen with COVID-19 as a crisis. It happened in China, the whole world was shut down. 
So our our perspective of viewing the conflict is it sh should change. Uh, the second thing is that um, we need to raise our capacity of resilience because that's very important. Today we have Corona crisis, we have the uh, uh, Russian-Ukraine war, tomorrow we'll have something else. So we need to be ready. And why women is important? Women is important uh, because they have a very big role to play. And many studies showed that women are very, very good uh, peace brokers, very good negotiators as well. But the problem is that they don't have a seat in the table of negotiations. So um, if we see also uh, today the uh, the number of uh, women who are participating also in the uh, uh, peace, UN peacekeeping mission, they have increased, although there is a gap uh, percentage between uh, the participation of men and women. But today, um, I think governments are making more efforts in advancing the role of women in peace building. Um, and I wanted to say uh, one thing quite important, uh, according to what I have noticed, uh, if I want to give the statistics in diplomacy, and you know, diplomacy today is very large, so you're not dealing with bilateral or multilateral relations, but you are dealing with crisis, you are dealing with peace, etc. And you know, in Morocco, for example, uh, according to 22 uh, statistics, uh, we have uh, uh, and uh, uh, 43%, we have 43% of women uh, diplomats in the in diplomacy sector, which is quite interesting. And we have 19 female ambassadors today. And one, what we have seen is that women ambassadors have played a key role in Corona crisis, in Ukraine war, and in many political crises that happened recently between Morocco and other countries. So we saw the women leadership. So we need to give a space for these women uh, in, in, in politics, uh, in, in the economy sector, and also uh, uh, in diplomacy. So I think um, if, if we want to uh, move forward with women's rights, first of all, we need to advocate to change the legislation a local le legislation and also involve women in global multilateral uh, negotiations because our countries are signing treaties and conventions and, and, and there are many conventions that concern women and women are not part of the uh, part of the uh, signatories and part not part of the negotiations. So um, I think uh, um, moving forward with a global strategy, and uh, to have more women in peace building process is important. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Karima, also for all the data uh, that you brought uh, about women who are engaged uh, in peace building uh, and in diplomacy. Um, uh, friends, uh, there are a lot of questions that were sent uh, to us already. Uh, thank you very much for that. And you can continue sending us, uh, but I will use my prerogative as a moderator moderator has to have some perks, right? Uh, to address the first question to uh, our panelists, and then I will go to the Q&A uh, from the audience. Um, uh, Karima and Anat, please be brief, because we want to cover uh, as many questions uh, as we can. Uh, so uh, Anat, for you, uh, in your head uh, of a peace activist. Um, so uh, when we, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, in the 80s, 90s, um, the, amount of women activists on the other side uh, in PA or you know, even before the PA uh, was a little bit uh, larger uh, than it is today. Um, of course, the name of Hanan Ashrawi comes uh, uh, to mind and uh, other top negotiators uh, for the Palestinians, the ministers in Tisar al-Wazir, uh, and uh, you know, there is a long, a long, a long uh, list. Um, do you believe uh, that it's easier uh, for the women to talk uh, to each other? Uh, do you think that there is a bigger chance that Israeli and Palestinian uh, peace activists, for example, right now we have women wage peace and the women of the sun uh, on the Palestinian side. Is it easier for them uh, to talk to achieve some common understanding uh, about issues than to men? Um, 
Yes and no. First of all, I'll tell you that the, during the 80s and 90s, it was easier to meet. There were no checkpoints, no fences, no a separation wall. You know, we could just drive to Ramallah and the people from Ramallah could drive to Tel Aviv. It was very easy to meet. And therefore, we had a lot of, of uh, meetings of uh, between women and we could, you know, actually do things together. And um, and create groups together, and we had a community of women, and and also the 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 I think the conflict was less of um, less armed then. I mean, the only demonstrations were with uh, stones and graffitis and you know things like that, not with with uh, ammunition and and um, rifles and uh, rockets and stuff like that, which really, you know, make it very hard for people to meet. And now there are all the checkpoints. Now, whether we can be more peace building uh, creatures, well, if we, I think that if we need to be feminist first, it's not that only women born as a peacemaker, you know, it's, it really is too generalized to say that all women are peacemakers. And we can see now in the Israeli parliament, you know, some women who really, really, really push back against uh, women achievements and so again, another, there is actually a question from the audience exactly about this. Okay. Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, a participant who asks, uh, um, do I women see really about have Margaret a Thatcher and the, yeah. Yes, and uh, Benazir Bhutto, you know, so are, are they really the different from the male leaders? Uh, so, is, is there really a different perspective uh, uh, for women uh, on, uh, you know, on peace, uh, war uh, and security? So, um, no. <laughs> I mean, experience show that no, women are not, you know, natural peace, peace builders. You need to be educated for that and you need to, to find your, your own virtues and you need to be a feminist. And another thing to answer this question, it's a very good question. Uh, there has never been any period in history, in modern history, that we know that women really ruled you know, because every leader is kind of an anecdote. And it's really very, um, it's not fair to judge a woman, a woman leader who, which is surrounded by, by male and to expect her to be, you know, to lead a feminist uh, policy. So, so I wouldn't judge either Benazir Bhutu nor uh, Gorda Meir or uh, Margaret Thatcher, but I can tell you that Sweden, for example, does have or did develop, you know, a feminist uh, policy um, uh, approach, a diplomacy approach, and they do have a plan for that. So you can do that, but you need, you really need, you know, a big a chunk of women uh, in 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 um, in uh, decision making forums to to really be able to to put it on the table and to make it part of your of the state policy, this is not the case in Israel and it's definitely not the case in Palestine. I don't know any other Arab country which is can be, you know, uh, reflect this this kind of uh, of a policy. Hopefully, in the future, uh, for the sake of all of us. We have yes. to keep optimistic. Uh, Karima, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, two years ago, more than two years ago almost, uh, something uh, truly amazing happened in the Middle East uh, that is uh, war-ridden, a conflict zone, uh, and is often in the news because of the bloodshed, not because of the peace. But two and a half years ago, uh, a few Arab states, Morocco among them, uh, decided to sign a peace deal uh, with Israel. Uh, the Abraham Accords with uh, uh, Bahrain and, uh, and uh, United uh, Arab Emirates, a separate peace treaty uh, with Morocco followed. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was this feeling that a uh, new Middle East is in the air. Um, while we do not know well whether other countries will be joining or not, I think it's very important to talk about deepening of the ties, of feeling uh, these uh, agreements with substance. And I want to ask you, we as women who aspire you know to 
peace uh, and to normal relations between our countries uh, and dream about building a new a just uh, society that will be integrated fully here in the region. What can we do? What can we do today in order to help uh, this very positive dynamic uh, of uh, Abraham Accords Plus, this is how I call them, um, uh, to flourish and uh, to develop. Thank you very much for this question. First of all, I would like to, to state that um, Morocco's relations uh, with Israel and Palestine is different from other countries because first of all, uh, you know, before the signing of the peace, uh, um, two years ago, um, our relations with the uh, the uh, Israelis uh, who have origins from of Morocco uh, is something that has continued. You know, uh, so it's very different uh, uh, case. I mean, it's very hard to compare with with others because uh, you know we have a, a Moroccan Moroccan Jews in Morocco, and then we have uh, Israelis who has a Moroccan origin. So that, that is something uh, which is quite very different from other countries. Uh, second, uh, I think it's very important to believe in dialogue. While we have our own position on, on the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, we, uh, we need to uh, work with both sides because if we don't foster dialogue, it's very hard to find a solution. It's very hard uh, to work together to advocate for uh, for peace uh, for both parties. So, uh, and, and I think uh, if I, I give the example of myself, when, when I came to the region, my, my perception has completely changed. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, building uh, uh, interfunctional relationship with other women-led organizations and just even networking with women, uh, from the region who believe in peace, who believe in dialogue, and sometimes it's very sen it could be very uh, sensitive, you know. And we saw that the uh, Palestinian journalists could not join us today. And you know, sometimes we find resistance, uh, people, uh, you know, backlash you, and uh, you know, uh, you find yourself in a very delicate uh, position. But I think we need to have a courage uh, to to uh, to work together. Uh, to find out a ground, to build networking. Um, uh, also, at the same time, it's very important to, um, uh, to um, foster collaboration between different women think tanks, uh, more specifically uh, on women issues. And I remember I've been talking with uh, different groups uh, that come to Morocco who ask me about women's rights, the advancement of human rights in Morocco. And when we discuss uh, with uh, Israeli groups who come to Morocco, we found that we have almost similar uh, issues, but differently. Uh, and then I saw one of uh, the questions who talk about patriarchal society. We have to admit that we live in a patriarchal society. We have cultural resistance. So uh, more or less, we have different cultures, but, but the, 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 the key resistance factors for women's rights are almost the same, whether in Israel, in Palestine, uh, even in, in New York, you know. So um, I, I think by working together on the things that makes us together more than the things that brings us apart is very important because if we uh, win the battle uh, to have more rights for women, and I think as I told in the beginning, women are uh, you know, very good peace brokers. I think if we have more women negotiators, more women mediators for peace, I think we, we might reach a, a solution because sometimes we, we, when, when we look at the global picture of the conflict, we will say, okay, this is a hopeless case. Old generation is hopeless case. They have their own agendas, they have their own objectives, but this young generation and more specifically generation of women could make a difference for the future. And so if we work together uh, 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 collaboratively, I think we can make together something uh, for the present and also for the future generations. Uh, thank you very much, Karima. And uh, because you brought up your personal experience of visiting Israel and Palestine uh, last year, I would just to remind, I would like to remind everyone that ROPES uh, offers uh, an opportunity for young leaders from across the Middle East uh, to visit our region uh, and to see for yourselves uh, what is uh, going on on the ground, 
uh, to meet Israelis, to meet Palestinians, uh, to talk to the other side, to both sides. Uh, you can find all of the information in our website, ropes.org. Uh, and uh, if uh, you want uh, to receive some more detailed information, you can write to our mail. Uh, friends, we have uh, two more questions uh, from the audience, uh, and I will address this question to the both of you. Um, what do you recommend folks in the US to do to help? Uh, I, I assume to advance uh, women's role uh, and uh, make women a more powerful players, I, I believe, in the international field. Uh, is there something that can be done and can be supported by uh, the US uh, or by civil society in the US? Karima, I would like to start with you from you, please. Yeah. Well, uh, I think, first of all, uh, um, uh, it's very important um, to uh, advance legislation that uh, uh, empower women uh, uh, to have uh, uh, senior level positions in government, in parliament, in local government, and different other uh, institutions that is very important because if we increase the participation of women in politics and all, also on the spheres of the economy, uh, we make sure that women have a voice in the policy making process, whether at uh, local national levels or at the global level. That's first. And I think second is to increase the percentage of representation of women uh, uh, at multilateral organizations. For example, if I uh, give the example of uh, Morocco, we have an envoy, uh, a UN envoy special to Syria. We have a, a special representative of the UN for um, uh, children's rights. So, uh, but this is very, very tiny percentage. So we need to, uh, um, you know, uh, work hard to um, improve representation uh, in multilateral organizations so that women at the global level uh, will be uh, women leaders uh, uh, who are making uh, decisions uh, and also uh, who are part of the negotiation process. And the second thing is to, uh, the third thing is to empower civil society organizations more women-led organizations in implementing women's right programs, uh, and at the same time, having uh, inter-regional programs uh, for peace building. So because uh, exchanging best practices and lessons learned uh, at the regional level, uh, we will help these organization con contextualize these experience uh, uh, to their local context and at the same time um, uh, benefit from all those uh, uh, exchanges in implementing programs. So I think uh, civil society with legislation, with global advocacy, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit complicated recipe, but it's not impossible. It can make a difference, certainly. Uh, Anat. Mm. Does you have cover? I think I think it's very easy to, in a way, because women are not, you know, a very rare um, product that you have to look for in in you know in, in different fields. We have women, as you said, women are fifty one percent of of the population. So first of all, one has to to develop um, some kind of glasses or an eye to look at any forum that we see and and you know just count how many women are there and 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 comment on that i mean it's really really easy whether it's a panel on television that deals with you know security diplomacy peacemaking whatever and you see only mail there you can you can just you know, log into your your uh, social media account and and comment on that and and tag tag people. I mean, everybody can do that from its own from his own uh, uh, keyboard. So we can participate in the activism in many many ways if we develop this this you know uh, sensitivity and this sentiment to see the reality through those, those glasses of how many women are participating. Uh, and uh, this is in addition to what Karima was saying, of course, but it, it's even easier, you know, if you see, if, if you are in a CEO somewhere and you have to choose a new worker and you, you have to, you can see how many women you have on board. And you can see if you can prefer or make some kind of um, affirmative action and see if you you can choose, you know, women from diverse groups that are not represented in, in your 
whatever, a company or organization or board or PTA, whatever. I mean, it's very easy to do that because it's, it's, it's handy. And um, I, I would suggest and recommend to start there and then go, you know, to the, low, to the, the upper levels and the, if people run for office and support women who run for office and support women who already um, reached a seat at the table and, and empower them and, and give them help and support them so they can succeed and, and really represent the voice of women. I mean, this, is, this would be my recommendations. Um, we have um, a question from uh, Leora Greenberg. My daughter is currently working and supporting Palestinians in South Hebron, the Masaf Riyata area, uh, do, doing a rapid response. How can she get more involved? Uh, will it still present for another two months? She's very passionate about her work and is doing something and is doing some writing. Um, Anna, do you have any information about this? Uh, I would be happy, Leora, also to connect you with the Save Masafriata campaign, but perhaps Sanat uh, has other tips. No, I think that you are more connected to that. I mean, there's, I know that there are several Israelis, young Israelis, who work there at the southern hills of, of Hebron, and it's really doing really amazing work uh, in supporting the Palestinians. And, uh, and just being there is a kind of, uh, of a mission and the very powerful mission. And, and uh, if she wants to bring their voices um, to the public, I think now it's quite easier through social media and, and you know, connect the people from, because she has the capacity and the, uh, and the, and the infrastructure to, to, you know, bring their voices into social media. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Leora, I will be sending you now also a link for Gilly Getz, uh, who is the coordinator, as I believe, and he is very often also in uh, uh, the United States, uh, but not not only there, of course. Uh, I will be sending you his um, uh, his uh, Facebook uh, information. Uh, I well, just let me sec. Okay, I'm sending it all, and uh, uh, if anybody is interested, I also recommend very much to read his page. Um, as we are nearing uh, the end, um, I would like just like to say uh, a, a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, both uh, Karima and uh, Anat, thank you very much for doing an amazing job. Uh, you pointed out very important uh, uh, as, um, elements uh, of how to deal, how to break down, you know, this uh, lack of uh, women, you know, in the, uh, the public eye. Uh, in uh, the offices in the civil society and so on. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, I believe that uh, if uh, in the Middle East, we will not support each other uh, in this struggle, uh, then we will be defeated apart. Uh, this is uh, basically my uh, conclusion from that. And I just have to I will remind you that uh, I was a member of Knesset uh, in the party that was led by a woman, uh, which is very rare, <laughs> Sipi Livni, yes. Uh, and when I made my decision to join the parliament, to run for office. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, affected me personally, it was that um, I want to join a party that is led by a woman. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, we had a full gender equality there, uh, six MKs, free men, free women. Uh, for me, it was something that was very important. So the more, the merrier, uh, and let's uh, uh, continue to work for this. Before we will part, uh, I, will want, I want to uh, uh, engage the minority, <laughs> the man here, the only man on our panel, our wonderful Ibrahim Abu Ahmed. Hello, Ibrahim. Uh, Ibrahim is a, a, a manager of uh, alternative tourism at Ropes. So he is uh, responsible for all of these delegations that are coming to Israel and Palestine uh, in order to have an opportunity to really see things for themselves. Uh, please, Ibrahim. Alan Osalem. First of all, thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who's attended this uh, conference. I apologize if my voice is still a little hoarse. We've had a couple of days of very tough protests, so we've been a little bit active in that. Um, uh, just a few words about myself. I'm, uh, as uh, Ksenia said, I'm the director of the Alumni Relations and the Tourism Project here at Ropes, and I had the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to meet uh, Karima, who uh, today uh, join us as well in the webinar, and we see the amazing work and the network that this organization is uh, doing in connecting people from across the world and bringing 
uh, a wonderful speaker like Amira to uh, be part of our network. I, I met with Ropes and with Ben, the founder of Ropes in 2019. Um, on a conference, and I heard about the views and the objectives of the, of the organization. Uh, as an Arab citizen of Israel, a Palestinian and an Israeli who believes that we are both of the above, who have been working for years on uh, integration, on uh, bringing uh, my community's voice forward, I definitely always believe that we are at the center of the uh, peace uh, making because we're the only ones who are both Israelis and Palestinians. And I always looked for ways to work on the conflict. And when the Abraham Accords started, I was also looking to find ways to work on the accords, maybe with embassies. And then I found ropes and uh, me and Ben um, discussed uh, working together. And uh, ever since I uh, participated in a few of the summits that we had, one of them in 2020, that it was an online summit during COVID, probably one of the exciting things that we had on that year. And uh, also in the Vienna conference a year later. And uh, since then I've joined uh, the, um, the team uh, full-time. I've done the, we had one delegation so far from across the Arab world last year to Israel and Palestine. And we had people from countries like Morocco, Qatar, uh, um, countries that don't have even official relations like Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And hopefully this year we can have another tour uh, like this one and bring in more people to shed light on the intricates and the complexity of the conflict because I think that's at the core of it. Uh, on one small thing, uh, discussing this panel, first of all, I'm really privileged and uh, to be part of something like this. I've always worked uh, and, and had a very much care uh, for the issue of bringing women into the table. I uh, did my uh, thesis and my bachelor's on uh, feminism and women involvement in the Arab world and cross referenced in that with uh, education and whether or not education among uh, Arab men will uh, improve the status of women. Um, I was studying in the American University in Cairo and on International Women's Day on that year, actually, um, the women of uh, Egypt went to the protests on International Women's Day to, add, to demand a seat at the table of the negotiation of a new government after the collapse of the Mubarak government. And they were pushed away from Tahrir Square. And it was not by um, you know, what is expected to be the religious radical. It was by the same supposed educated secular men who were standing next to them in Tahrir Square every day. They were the ones who were asking the women to leave and that their part is over. So our work on education alone as the simple aspect of just studying is not enough. It needs to be education on the important role of women. And uh, I am very proud that we here at Ropes are uh, putting an emphasis on that and continuing to work and to bring in voices of minorities um, of different communities of across the Middle East, because this is the only way forward, as Ksenia said at the beginning, of discussion and collaboration. And our work, this work that we've been doing so far is only being done possible by the amazing support that we've been had from our wonderful donors who have made all of this possible. And if you also uh, share this view and believe in our, uh, in our vision and our view, uh, you are welcome. Uh, to, uh, to join us and uh, to consider a uh, tax deductible donation to our to support our activities. You can do it by a credit card if you wish by scanning the QR code that you have here on the screen. Or if you're looking to do uh, a, tra a transfer by bank wire, feel free to contact us at uh, info at robes.org and we will give you all the details needed. So thank you to all our panelists. Thank you, Xenia, for this wonderful uh, discussion. And I hope it was, uh, and for me, it was very illuminating. And thank you to all uh, our participants for listening and to being with us today. This is truly uh, a pleasure of ours to share our views from here, from the heart of the Middle East, and to take this place forward to a better, much, much better future for all of us. Thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. We definitely need more feminist men uh, everywhere. Uh, so thank you very much for, you know, who you are. Uh, I would like to thank again, uh, Anat, Karima, you were wonderful. 
Uh, it was very illuminating. Thank you. I would like also to congratulate everybody who celebrates uh, and uh, who who fasts and who has iftar soon uh, and so on uh, with the Ramadan Karim, Ramadan Mubarak. We hope that it will be a peaceful Ramadan uh, for each and every one of us. Uh, and also to, of course, to our Jewish participants and viewers. Chag uh, Sameach, happy Passover. Uh, it's uh, next week. Uh, then we will celebrate Mimuna. Uh, that used to be a Moroccan heritage, a Jewish Moroccan, but it became for everyone. Uh, I'm personally going to celebrate it uh, and uh, hope to see you again soon uh, in the uh, ROPES webinar uh, series. Thank you. Shalom, ma salama, and goodbye.